We just heard a story about spies. Spycraft is something that intrigues many of us. It interests me. If you don't believe me, just consider the movies and the shows and the novels that we all enjoy so much. Well, along these lines of spycraft, I came across a story this week on NPR that talks about spycraft from the point of view of former CIA operatives. One of the more intriguing facts that I learned in this story is that restaurants are a key to spycraft. A former spy says, restaurants and cafes are in many ways the lifeblood of espionage. <laughs> restaurants offer the opportunity to meet the people we most seek. Targets with access to a group that might be able to help us predict or prevent the next attack. For the most part, those meetings are planned to look accidental. The article goes on to explain that spies are trained in things like how to flip or crash a car, how to use a Glock, how to parachute, how to use a speedboat, how to withstand torture, how to use a grocery bag and duct tape to bandage a punctured chest, and how to neutralize various targets. But they are also trained on how to scope out restaurants. It goes on to say that the restaurant is an invaluable cog in the grammar of intrigue. It offers intelligence officers not only a place to exchange information, but a place to evaluate their informant's personality, psychology, and various practices over a meal. Routine espionage involves endless hours of drinking coffee at cafes that are being cased and scouted for prospective meetings. Chains like Panda Express, Panera Bread, McDonald's, and Starbucks are handy operational sites. So one former operative reveals how an instructor at the CIA came up with an ingenious way to use Starbucks gift cards as a signaling tool instead of the chalk signs and lowered blinds. He gives a Starbucks gift card to each of his assets and tells them, if you need to see me, buy a coffee. And every day he checks the number on that gift card to see if anyone has purchased coffee. And if a purchase has been made, he knows he has a meeting. This former informant, former CIA operative says, since the card numbers are not tied to identities, the whole thing is pretty secure. And so there you have it. The next time you go to Mickey D's or St. Arbuck's, just know that the safety and the security of the whole free world depends upon the secret meetings that are likely taking place in the open spaces all around you. Well, the spies in our story engaged in a different kind of espionage. They were the leading men of the 12 tribes of Israel. And these 12 spies came together to form a special forces unit that sent into the land of Canaan to scout out the land of Canaan. Now, Canaan plays a key role in the story of the Bible. You might say that Canaan is one of the primary characters of the Bible, uh, but it's a character that we don't often think about in that way. It's a character that's very important in the role of the story of the Bible. It is this same region, Canaan is this same region as the original land where the Garden of Eden was created. It is the place where God led Abram, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the land which God promised to give them and their descendants. It is the land that Joseph came from when his brothers sold him into slavery. It is the same land that his father Jacob and his brothers left during a time of famine to go down to Egypt. It is the same land that God promised to give Israel when he brought them out of Egypt. And he's been describing this land the whole time as a land flowing with milk and honey. 
And so God gathers these spies together and says, send the spies into the land to verify what I've already told you about the land. The spies are sent with the promise of God echoing in their ears and firmly rooted in their hearts. Verse 2 of chapter 13 says that God told Israel once again, I am giving you the land. And so they know going into this that this is a gift. The land is based on God's grace. He is giving it to them. It's theirs for the taking. The promise has been repeated many, many times since we first met Abram in Ur of the Chaldees. And here we are. We're finally reaching the point where the promise of God is going to be fulfilled and realized in the life of his people. These spies are sent into the land on a specific mission with a specific purpose in mind. Verses 17 to 20, God tells them to gather intel and to collect data. Learn everything you can about the land. Bring it all back and tell the people about it. As I was thinking about the story this week, I thought this tells us that God likes to play show and tell. He's been telling them about the land. He's been using words to describe the land. But now he's going to send representatives of Israel into the land to gather the intel and to come back. And as eyewitnesses, they're going to be able to say Everything God told us about the land is true. It's right. It's a delightful, beautiful land. Let's go take it. This is what God is hoping the spies are going to do. And so the spies go into the land to see with their own eyes what God has been telling them. The idea is that they're going to come back and verify what God has said and validate God's promises. The spies are to scout out the whole land, top to bottom. To help you understand a little bit about what that means, what the size and scope of the land is, I did a little research for you, and we're talking about a land area that's roughly the size of New Jersey. I know that means nothing to most of you because you're from Texas, and you think, what's New Jersey? Is that even a place? Is that a state? So let me bring it to uh, closer to home for you. It's roughly a land area the size uh, of land that stretches from Dallas down to San Antonio and basically Fort Worth over to Rockwall. That would be the land that they are to scope out for about 40 days. So they're to do this, top to bottom, left to right, north, south, east, west, go all over the place and get all of the information they can and come back. Now keep in mind, they don't have cell phones. They can't, take, uh, they can't take pictures, they can't do any TikTok, there's nothing, no Facebook Live, none of that. So what they're told to do is bring back some fruit. And so they bring back a giant cluster of grapes. That's the best they can do in their day. In that time frame, 40 days pass. And we know that Israel's patience runs out at about the 40-day mark. We learned that last week when they grew weary of waiting on Moses, who had been on the mountain for 40 days. And remember, they said, we don't even know what happened to this guy. Let's do our own thing. Well, we run the same risk here. The spies go into the land. We don't even know what happened to those guys. They might be tempted to do their own thing. But they wait. The spies come back after 40 days, and at first, they have a promising report. The promising report is everything God told us is right and good and true. It's just as he said. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. It is fruitful and flourishing. See, look at these giant grapes that it took two of us to carry them back to you. Wow, everyone's amazed. But then something happens in verse 28. And it's very important that you put your eyes on this, verse 28, because there is a word there that doesn't just change this episode in the series. It changes the entire series. It is a word that changes the whole story. It is upon this word that the whole story of the Bible pivots from this point on. And it is this simple word, however... However, you see, they've just given the report that everything God said is right, good, and true. He just described the land as a land flowing with milk and honey. And everyone's like, wow. And they say, 
Well, however, and that gets everyone's attention. And it's what happens after the however that we're going to focus on now. Because this word however is a word that signals trouble. It is a word that marks a turning point. It is a word that signals a problem that is deep down in the heart of the spies. And then we're going to discover it's also deep down in the heart of the people of Israel. And it might even be deep down in your heart. However, I know what God said. I hear God's word. I see what the scriptures are telling me. However, and then fill in the blank. And this is what happens with Israel. They feel that the problem is out there somewhere. The problems that are confronting them are in the land of Canaan. The problems are in the giants, among the giants and those with great strength. The problem is out there. But what they're going to learn is that the problem is not out there. The real problem is in here. It's in their heart. It's in their community. It's even in the leaders of their people. Now, how do we know that that's the problem? We know it's the problem because initially their report simply echoed God's word. It's like they're giving us book, chapter, and verse. The Bible says the land is flowing with milk and honey. It is flowing with milk and honey. But our experience tells us that it is a land that devours its inhabitants. And so now you have the revelation of God pitted against personal experience. Which one is going to win out in that contest? Land flowing with milk and honey, a land that devours its inhabitants. Which will it be? And what we find happening here is that the spies begin to act very much like the serpent in the Garden of Eden. They begin to use subtle language to undermine God's word, to stir up doubt and fear among God's people. Their personal interpretation of their life experience begins to contradict the revelation of God and what God's revelation says about their life experience. They're walking by sight, not by faith. They're trusting in their natural instincts and natural insights more than they are trusting in spiritual impulses and spiritual insights. They're trusting in the size and the strength of men rather than in the spirit of God. They say, the people are like giants, and we are like grasshoppers. They're very big, but we are very small. There's no way we can go into this land. Now, it probably doesn't help matters that when they go into the land and they get to the heart of the land, that's where they find the giants, And the heart of the land is important because it's at the heart of the land where Abram first came to the land and built an altar and pitched his tent. It's in the heart of the land that Abram bought a cave and used for a tomb. It's at the heart of the land that other of their forefathers dwelled and were buried. They are terrified because at the very heart of this land that God has promised to give them, there is a gigantic obstacle known as the giants in the land. They saw that they were strong and fortified and that their weapons were sharper and pointier, that they had more vicious intent, and they began to lose their stomach for warfare. They began to lose their courage. I want you to think about this language here. They are like giants. We are like grasshoppers. What this means is that in less than one year, In less than a year, these people have forgotten what the outstretched arm of the Lord can do. They have forgotten what God can do with an army of locusts. They have forgotten that if God can bring down an empire to its knees with an army of locusts, then surely God can bring down a few war tribes with an army of grasshoppers. 
But their hearts are not calibrated to look at the world through faith in that way. Their hearts are very Egyptian-like. They don't trust the Lord. And this is surprising because if you were reading all of the book of Numbers up to this point, you would see this repeated phrase over and over again. It says, and the people did everything the Lord God commanded them to do. And the people did everything the Lord God commanded them to do. And it is as if the people have started obeying God from Sinai to this desert point, And now they're saying, this is as far as we go with our obedience. We have obeyed you up to this point. This is where we draw the line. We have trusted you up to this point. But this is where we draw the line. So no more trust. No more obedience. We've reached our limits with you. This is what they're in effect saying to God. They face the same kinds of problems that you and I face in life. And the problem is that often in life, the problems of our life seem so big and the promises of God seem so small. Or to put it another way, the promises of life just seem to contradict and conflict with the promises of God. And so rather than wait upon the Lord, rather than seek a spiritual resolution to that tension, we, much like our forefather Israel, seek natural and material resolutions to our problems. We lose patience with the Lord. Not even after 40 days. It might be 40 seconds, 4 minutes, less than an hour. Maybe a week. And then we grow weak. And we lose our nerve. What happens here is that as the spies act like the serpent in the Garden of Eden, the people of God are thrown into chaos and disorder. All the congregation raised a loud cry and the people wept that night. They weren't weeping because they weren't going to be able to go take the land. They were weeping because they were afraid that they would have to go try. They weren't weeping because God had somehow pulled his promises back from them. They were weeping because they thought the problems they were now facing were much bigger than those promises. And so all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and against Aaron. They're gripped by fear. They're grumbling without faith. And I just want to make a little side comment about grumbling here. Because grumbling is one of those things that's like low-hanging fruit for pastors. Right? People complain a little bit and we want to say, hey, watch out, don't grumble. Right? You saw what happened to Israel. This isn't an ordinary kind of grumble. This isn't like, I can't believe the traffic is so bad. I can't believe there's so much month at the end of the money. I can't believe I can't, whatever. It's not the ordinary kind of grumbling we do. This kind of grumbling that they're in trouble for is, in effect, a confession of disbelief and doubt. It is their way of saying, we don't trust God anymore. We're not going to do what he said anymore. We're not putting up with his nonsense any longer. This is their way of raising a fist to heaven and saying, we don't believe you. This is the moment in which they become functional atheists. The spies have come and disrupted the peace and the unity of the church. They brought a false gospel. That's what bad report means. They brought a false gospel to the people. And as a result, they have destroyed the decency and the order of the community. And the whole congregation descends into the utter chaos of conflicts and contradictions. The spies were speaking and acting like the serpent in the garden. They presumed to know the future. They presumed to know God's mind better than God knew his own mind. They acted as if they were God's. And so they're subtle in all of the ways that they undermine God's word. But here's the net effect of what they did. 
As the serpent deceived Eve in the garden, so the spies deceived the children of Eve in the wilderness. They distorted God's word. The land will devour us. We will not delight in it. They doubted God's word. We're all going to die. Our little ones will become prey for the mighty beast in the land of Canaan. We will not defeat our enemies. They disobeyed God's word. Let's elect a new leader that God has not elected and let that leader take us back to Egypt. We will depart from the Lord, from this land, from his promises and go back to our old way of life. All of this happened because the spies lost their courage and fell from grace and dragged the whole congregation down into the chaos of their cowardice. In recent days, we've heard lots of buzz in the news about how our nation and our communities stand at a crossroads of courage and cowardice. It's out there. It's in here. It's something we all have to face and confront. C.S. Lewis helps put things in perspective in this way. A generation ago, before things were as bad as they are now, I think he saw it coming, Lewis wrote a book called The Abolition of Man. And in that book, he tackles a culture of systemic cowardice, among other things. And he says, We make men without chest and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings bear fruit. In another work... He wrote a counterpoint on courage, where he says, Courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point, which means at the point of highest reality. And so what Lewis is saying is, we expect people to be courageous, but we remove from them the tools, the virtues the skills, the spirit that would make them courageous and turns them into cowards. And we despise cowardice even in our day, even in a post-Christian world. We despise cowardice because something deep down inside of us knows it's terribly wrong. It's despicable. But where does courage come from? It doesn't come from facing some imaginary giant in your head. It comes from facing the realities of life every day. At the highest reality of life where you are tested the most. Will you do what is right? Will you do what is good? Will you do what is required of you in that moment? In the moment when you least want to do it. In the moment when you feel tempted to turn aside. It's courage. To do the right thing. And that is where we come in this story. Ten of the spies that went into the land were cowards. They were men without chests. They were traitors and serpents among the community of God's people. And they wrecked shop. That's what cowards do. Two of the spies, two of the spies were courageous. When they were tested at the point of highest reality, when they were confronted with obstacles greater than themselves, when they were staring down the spears and the lances and the swords of those giants, when they were looking at those fortified walls, when they were making their way through the hard land of promise, climbing over the rocks, sneaking around through the trees, fording rivers, when they were tested at the highest point of reality, they were courageous. And they said, the Lord is our God. He is true. He is right. He will give us this land. 
And so they come back to give their report. Albus Dumbledore in Harry Potter says this to the students under his watchful eye. There are all kinds of courage. It takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies. But it takes just as much to stand up to our friends. And what were Joshua and Caleb doing on this day? They were standing up to their friends. So while the ten spies were saying, we can't do it, we've got to turn back, it's too dangerous, it's unsafe, we're going to be at risk. Joshua and Caleb speak to the whole congregation of Israel. They stand up to their friends and note the bravery and the courage of these two men whose very lives are being threatened, not by the giants in the land, not by the strong ones dwelling in Cana, but by the cowards camped around them in Israel. Their lives are threatened by them. You see, the cowards think, we can take out two or three guys, but we can't go take the land. And it's in the midst of that that they stand up before all the congregation and say, and this is found in Numbers 14, the land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. You see that? They are bread for us. We will devour them. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And you would think that with a stirring speech like this, with all of that courage in the face of cowardice, the people would repent and believe the gospel. But no. All the congregation said, let's stone them with stones. Cowards need to snuff out the courageous because the courageous make them look so terribly pitiful and bad. You need to make up your mind today what you're going to do in the time of trouble. Don't wait until the time of trouble to decide if you're going to be courageous or not. You need to put to death cowardice in your heart and cultivate courage in the spirit of the Lord. I sent you a message this week asking you to do some prep work. I don't know if all of you saw it, but just in case you didn't, I asked you to spy out your own heart. Don't try to spy out the heart of the liberals or the conservatives. Don't try to spy out the heart of those who are anti-gun or pro-gun. That's not what this conversation is about. Go deeper. Spy out your own heart. Spy out your own heart and ask yourself, do you see your life in light of God's promises? Or do you see your life in light of your problems? Do you grumble over God's provision and care for you? Or do you give thanks to God in all things? Do you face your world with courage or with cowardice? Do you hide behind your family? Lots of excuses with your family. My wife, my children, they'll be a prey. Do you hide behind your family? Or do you hide your family behind the Lord? Who will you serve this day? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, says Joshua. Do you find yourself holding fast or cutting loose? To the things of God, turning back or pressing on towards the promised land. Spy out your own heart. See what you find there. See what you need to put to death. See what you need to stone. See what you need to keep alive and feed and encourage. 
The Apostle Paul applies the story of Numbers 13 and 14 to the church, which includes you and me, in this way in the book of Hebrews chapter 3. And reflecting on this story, he says, Take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Take heed, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are partakers of Christ if we hold fast to the beginning of our confidence firm as far as the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, you must not harden your hearts. You must not harden your hearts the way Pharaoh did in Egypt and brought his whole empire down. You must not harden your hearts the way the spies did when they came back from the land of Canaan and brought the whole community of Israel down. You must not harden your hearts in the face of difficulty of life. But your heart must be broken and contrite before the true and living God. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And to whom did God swear that they would never ever enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter God's rest because of disbelief and disobedience. Those are two surefire ways to keep yourself out of heaven. Out of the rest that Christ promises you. So therefore, while the promise of entering God's rest still stands, what must we do? Two things. Let us fear God, lest any of us should seem to have failed to reach the goal. And let us strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience that we see in our forefathers in Israel. We need courage. In the face of conflict, in the face of controversy, we need courage. We're facing hard times. Inflation is no joke. It's getting harder and harder to make ends meet. We're still trying to repent of old sins that haunt us. We've got spiritual warfare. We've got temporal warfare. We've got struggles all over the place. We feel that life is uncertain. Things seem unstable. There's mounting pressure all around us. What are we going to do as we stand at the crossroads between the wilderness and the promised land? What are we going to do? What do we do in the face of such darkness, in the face of such despair? What do we do? How shall we live? I thought, what if we reimagined, what if we reimagined Caleb's and Joshua's speech to Israel in this way? And what if we heard these words coming to us from our spies and our scouts? Indeed, our messengers of the gospel. And what if we heard them say, Hold your ground. Hold your ground. I see in your eyes the same fear that would take the heart of me. A day may come when the courage of men fails. When we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship. But it is not this day. An hour of giants and shattered shields when the hope of men comes crashing down. But it is not this day. This day we fight. And this day, if you hear his voice, do not. Harden your hearts as our fathers did in the wilderness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Let us pray.